Hello and welcome to the Tech Marketing Trends, where we delve into intersection of technology, B2B sales and marketing, and the future of work. So happy to have you with us. And uh, today's episode, we're thrilled to host Matt Doyon, who's a seasoned sales expert. He's author of Revenue Revolution and some kind of a pioneer in air-powered sales coaching, and also the visionary CEO behind Triple Session, uh, which is a groundbreaking app for sales professionals. And we will hear a little bit more about those things, but we will definitely talk more about AI and how it revolutionizes sales coaching, moving from traditional methods to more real-time skill enhancement and things like that. So today's title is AI Powered Sales Coaching. And with that short introduction, I wanna welcome you, Matt. Good to have you with us. Great to be here. Yeah, awesome. And you're one of the experts in AI-based sales coaching and your work full-time that, but you know, maybe you can just give us in your own words, a little bit of your background and career journey so far. Yeah, I don't think it's very atypical from a lot of salespeople. I never really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. So that led me into university and taking a bunch of different courses and stuff that I would never pursue, got out, graduated, still not knowing what. I wanted to do and then just landed in an advertising sales job. This is going to date myself now. This is selling print advertising for a daily newspaper. So for the millennial audience that's listening, we used to read these things called <laughs> newspapers that were actually physically papers that people would actually read and businesses would pay to advertise in them. And I sold there. Um, but I was in my early 20s, I had no money, and I quickly found that I could just make money talking to people and explaining the value of a product or service, and I was in love. So this controllable aspect of my career that seemed to fit my personality just kind of stuck in back then. And then it's been happily ever after since then, found my way eventually into tech and then SaaS specifically about 15 years ago. And that seemed to be where it was best fit for me. Awesome. Wow. Interesting. And you have picked up some really good skills and insights over the way there. And actually, you have already written a book about some of those things that you released very newly, and you call it Revenue Revolution. And, you know, maybe you can talk about a little bit, you know, what you're writing about there and why and why now. Yeah, that was more of a therapeutic uh, exercise where when you make as many mistakes as I've made along the way and had to quickly correct or else die, um, you learn some things along the way. And as I was transitioning out of one role as a CRO of a SaaS startup into my next venture, I had this moment of a breather that I could actually reflect and there were a lot of things that surfaced from that as far as things that my organization got right initially and panned out. Those were in the minority. And then a lot of stuff that I got wrong in the early days and had to go back and revisit and correct. And at the same time, I was doing a lot of advisory for SaaS sales and revenue teams and seeing a lot of those same mistakes play out mm -hmm. based on understanding customer messaging and persona and identifying ideal customers and process and how to hire the best salespeople, all of these information points that snap together to make a sales and revenue organization work. I just kept seeing a lot of people make the same mistakes that I made. So if I thought if I could just get this out and help people not step in a lot of the landmines that I stepped in, then there could be some force of good that could come from this eight year journey I had as mm -hmm. a CRO. So we got together with Wiley, who's a great publisher, put it mm -hmm. out back in October. Uh, yeah, you can buy it on Amazon. And all proceeds go to a nonprofit I'm working with called build.org, who teaches entrepreneurship in under-resourced communities. So buy the book, yeah. do a good thing, help, uh, help kids learn how to be entrepreneurs. That's great. And I contributed since I bought it on Kindle recently now, <laughs> before this interview. Well, mm -hmm. that's, that's generous of you. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there that's interesting and also a bit, uh, challenging for, for everybody who's in sales, of course, these days. So 
if you just would break it down a little bit, what are your you know thoughts about <laughs> the revenue revolution uh, uh, in in a nutshell, so to say? Yeah, there are two big underlying forces that are moving at the same time, and it's really changed the world that we're working in. One is economic, where the economic landscape that we are now living in really changed seismically back in 2022. We could talk about what led up to that and where we are now. And it will stay this way or actually probably get a little bit worse for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that's a new normal that we have to readjust ourselves to the boom years that we sold into from 2000 to 2020 are gone. The pandemic years, which for SaaS were this weird balloon, this bubble that we had for two years from 2020 to the end of 2021, that was an aberration. That's long gone. And now we're in this new reality. Uh, that's going to be here for a while. So piece one is that. Piece two is technology is moving faster than ever, especially with the release of AI. Yeah. And the forward thinking leaders today are watching where things are moving and they're snapping their businesses into the cutting edge where they can to maximize efficiency, use data, use information as an advantage and make sure they're well positioned for this rocky road ahead. So these two things, they're happening at the same time, they overlap. And for forward thinking business leaders, they're really seeing both of them as to what they mean for their businesses mm -hmm. and taking full advantage of both right now. It's a mm -hmm. challenge, but each challenge has an opportunity. And for the sales and CS and business leaders that are looking at that as an opportunity, they're gonna be fine. Everybody else, Oh boy, it's going to be a rough decade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, rings true to my ear, and and I think most companies have experienced a, a much rougher uh, a road uh, already from from a year or so back behind. So yeah, definitely, definitely. And your specialty is AI powered sales coaching. So let's start there, and maybe then we transition to other areas there as well. But you know, how does AI power sales coaching differ from traditional sales coaching methods? Because I think we're a lot of people or organizations trying to coach and we're trying to up our skills in our sales teams and we're trying mm -hmm. to this and that. And, you know, there's a lot of things going on as always, but you have focused on this area. So so what does it mean and how can it be useful for, for a sales team and so forth? Yeah, the short answer is speed and power. So when we look at sales coaching and the data has borne this out for years, coaching is the most valuable use of a sales manager's time with his or her team. Mm. No, no effort gets a better return on time investment than a manager listening to calls, working with a rep, sitting down, analyzing performance, offering feedback and helping that frontline rep learn this very challenging job that we have in sales and get better and better and better over time. The way we've always done that is very analog, very manual, where it's actually just this human to human conversation, very time consuming. The manager is typically listening to calls, even with all of the conversation intelligence today, they still listen to calls, make notes, give feedback. And it has impact, but it can only work on the small scale until recently. Mm -hmm. Now with AI, what you can actually do is, for all intents and purposes, build a clone of yourself as a sales manager. You can download your brain, upload it into AI, say, what would I look for in a call with my sales process specifically? What are the good, the bad, and the ugly I evaluate? How can I score it? How can I grade it? And how can I give feedback to the rep? And now use AI to do that on every call, every stage, every deal for every salesperson on the team. So typically today, when we when I talk to organizations that are not doing this, but still fairly mature, they'll tell me the same thing. We do that for about 10, 15, 20% of the calls we have coming through. 
and the reps benefit from it greatly. AI allows you to flip the switch and do that for 100% of the calls and give immediate feedback. And not only that, identify weak spots in deals, shore them up, bring a manager in, give attention. It's just changed the game in terms of efficiency of work and getting to the answer faster. So speed, we can get those results from coaching real time now and offer the, that feedback right away. And power, we could do it in mass with great detail and cover the entire spectrum of all sales calls that are happening. So it's quickly, quickly changed the game as far as what it's able to do for conversion rates throughout the process, average revenue, increasing win rates, helping salespeople keep tight feedback loops so they can improve faster. Very interesting. And and I know we have had a few softwares around, maybe Gong was one of the pioneers, maybe where we at least got some feedback on, on the stats and things like that. But how do we practically, you know, can we actually have a software doing all this already today? Yeah, so full transparency, I love Gong. I love their data. I was a Gong user. And for the AI world, and I've had to get really deep into this in the last couple of years, it's not all one monolithic world. Mm -hmm. When we look at AI, first, it was born in a world of AI scarcity. There were a few businesses that really held the keys to the AI city. And it was very big data focused, very top down, and it still has value. So when we look at things like Gong or Chorus or other conversation intelligence, they tell you valuable insights like talk time and cadence, and are you using these keywords? Mm -hmm. And uh, can we pull out certain certain quotes that are valuable? And that's that's truly valuable. Where the miss is when we look at top down is that it's not customizable to my team, my conversation, my process, how we look at the world internally and what we know great looks like. Mm -hmm. For that, you really still need the manager's brain, but you don't need the manager's brain manually. You can mm -hmm. automate and again, synthesize the manager's brain to look at every call. And that's AI from the bottom up, which is completely new now. That's what the chat GPT revolution, if we want to call it that, really sparked last year. Mm -hmm. It's taken AI from scarcity and turned it into AI abundance. So now I could take my brain as a sales leader, program it into AI in my very unique sales process and say, what would I actually say about this call? and the feedback that I would offer and the pat on the back to the rep to say, you did great at this stuff here. And then where are the weak spots? Okay, we can identify those. And of those weak spots, what is the number one thing that we need to make sure we tighten up first, not just in this deal, but in your process overall. So I can actually have the AI write out a coaching plan to say, okay, for this deal, Let's make sure we nail down these couple pieces before we move forward or else we're going to lose. And for your process, spend some time tightening up your skills over here so your next call goes better on the first round. Completely new. Yeah, exciting. So the to, to make an analog picture to uh, chat GPT, it's like you know uploading your own GPT to a coaching software like <laughs> something and and uh, yeah so really interesting and um that is probably not common use today as what i understand or is it no it's very new and and a lot of the likeness that you could see that gets a little bit more talked about in the market is we we look at things like famous podcasters where AI will clone a podcast that they never ran. There was one about Joe Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs, which never yeah. happened, but it sounded exactly like them, weirdly so. Or music artists where you have like Drake and AI can clone a Drake song and it sounds exactly like Drake. Now what we could do is, hey manager, let's clone you and have your clone listen to, give feedback and coach on every call. That yeah. thing that you would love to do if you had infinite time, because you get a lot of return on that investment, it's just impossible for you to do that. 
Mm. Don't worry about it. We're going to clone you and have the clone do it all day long. Yeah. Listen, analyze, and give feedback on calls. Exciting, exciting, and and wow, uh, another area of AI, you know, conquering. <laughs> yeah, we want this one to be used for the forces of good, though. Actually, yeah. help people learn, get better, do better for customers. Customers benefit from this too. There's nothing worse than a poor performing sales rep. Yeah, uh, they do a bad That's job good. with prospects. They get pushy. Mm -hmm. They get aggressive. It it gets ugly out there. So yeah. if we could help save not only sales teams but prospects from that reality mm. and we are putting some positive energy in the world i love it great and that takes us a little bit on the impact on sales jobs going forward there's a lot of discussion around ai that you know replacing a lot of works and and jobs and things like that and as an ai expert in the sales field in your view how does ai impact the sales roles specifically yeah. So as a species, we humans like to freak out whenever we possibly can and mm -hmm. indulge in overreaction. Um, and this has happened all through history. The industrial revolution caused this, Hey, we're going to be out of jobs and nobody's going to work anymore. And we used to live on whale oil and then all the whales got killed. Mm -hmm. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going to be without it. Like this happens with every new technology, every new cycle. The biggest one I remember was when chatbots started to come out about mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Oh, this is gonna kill BDRs. We don't need them anymore. People come to sites, the chatbot will handle everything and that's gone. We have more BDRs than ever. Mm -hmm. With AI, it's the same thing. So there are two reasons why AI is not only going to not kill sales jobs, it's actually gonna create them. Number one, AI makes you smarter. It actually helps you do a better job and makes you more human. It's, it's ironic to think of this, but the robots are making us more human because they tell us how to interact with the other robots, out, with the other humans out there. Mm -hmm. So because of that, they are going to do a lot of the dirty work that again, managers usually need to do to make us much more effective when we need to work. And because we're human, we are still just grown up orangutans, really. Uh, we're still emotional. We still react. We're still in this paleolithic brain that we have in our heads. And we're still making decisions emotionally, not rationally. The robots are great with rational logic, but you still need that contextual, tangible human element if you're going to succeed. And anybody that's called into a call center and gone through their AI and tried to work through things with the robots knows this. They would rather talk to a human to get help. As imperfect as we are, mm -hmm. we still prefer one another. And the robots are helping us make more of a reality of that. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, with the economy, we need greater efficiency. AI helps the humans be more efficient. And the best model, the best performing model today is certainly not all human, no technology. That is a losing proposition. It's not pure technology with no humans either because people get frustrated, things get lost. It's a cyborg organization mm -hmm. where you have humans empowered by technology, mm -hmm. just like it's always been since the industrial revolution. It's the same today. We're not going anywhere. We're gonna be just fine. Yeah, that's wonderful. And do you see any difference in how the sales job will evolve? Is there parts of it that we will stop doing and other things that we think we start doing? And how should you, yeah, how should you think about what you should move towards if you're in the sales profession? Yeah, so this is why it's going to be great for sales and it's and everybody working in sales is going to be fine. Our efficiency is going to be so much greater mm -hmm. and we work in a wildly inefficient world today. Mm -hmm. So when we look back 10 years from now on 2024, we're going to say, wow, how did we ever work in such a slow, low performing environment as that 2024 environment? Because if you think about all the wasted time, I waste time getting in touch with prospects that don't care about me, where the timing is wrong, where I can't break through. I waste a lot of time in manual stuff, manual tasks, data entry, pulling lists together. 
dialing numbers, sending emails. Like there's so much waste filling out CRM, getting call sheets, getting next steps, writing follow-up emails. Like there's a lot of that logic work that AI is going to completely take over and be the ride along assistant for every role in sales. And that's going to make the humans that work in sales far more efficient and much more logical when you look at it from a financial perspective as to why I want that person in the organization just plugged into a lot of AI. So what's gonna go away? List building, prospecting, understanding where to get great data on things like LinkedIn and scraping websites and stuff that people voluntarily put out into the market, all that work that's still a lot of manual stuff, that's all going to be done by AI very quickly. Mm -hmm. Writing great email message copy, that's already starting to change and go mm -hmm. away. That's going to be automated. The plays that come out of how to message somebody on a email and then tag them on LinkedIn and make a copy and then send a message. All that cadence stuff is all going to be automated and run and operated by AI. And then we'll drop the humans in for that critical point where a phone call matters, hearing the human voice matters, jumping on a call where you could see somebody matters. We'll mm -hmm. plug the humans in where they can add value and where they're maximizing their efficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's moving fast. A lot of these pieces are already in place. Yeah, yeah, it's moving fast. So, yeah, just like when we are seeing um, in previous tech shifts when e-commerce, you know, swapped out <laughs> territory salespersons driving around selling paper like, you know, Dunder Mifflin <laughs> companies like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they, they are commodities that we never would take a sales meeting in order to buy these days. But but yeah, so we're moving upstreams as as a sales collective, I suppose, doing more advanced stuff, having more complex discussions, and focus on on you know providing more value uh, rather than looking for email addresses and and researching on LinkedIn. So definitely exciting times, but boy, the shift is going fast. So um, yeah, it is, and fortunately, it's getting so much attention that people are taking it seriously and they're looking at those opportunities and we're starting to build some virtual cycles here where the speed up will just help to improve and optimize performance, which will speed things up. And it's so important now with the economic forces that have taken over and we're going to live with for the next 10 years. Yeah. This is going to be a need to have now. Yeah. And if you tie that back to I mean, you have talked a lot about the economic factors. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I think, I know you write a lot about the, the hunt for efficiency, that the fat and happy days are, are you know, behind us. And now we need to be lean and <laughs> effective and yeah. do the right things and stuff like that. So I suppose that is accelerating the whole uh, quest for finding better stuff, better tech and better uh, processes in order to drive our different departments and especially sales and marketing maybe towards, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank God for the robots that they've arrived just in time to save us from ourselves because uh, we're going to live in this new economic reality and, and sadly it's going to get a bit worse and stay worse for a while before it gets better. Why do you think so? So um, there's this old expression uh, and it's still used today in financial corners where if you look at investments, they always say, hey, past performance does not project future outcomes. So they have to put that in there legally. Hey, just because it's performed a certain way in the past doesn't mean that's going to continue. Mm -hmm. Nowhere is that more true than in our financial times now, especially in software and technology. So why do I say that? We lived in an artificial environment for 20 years. And because we lived in it so long, we thought it was real, but it wasn't. And that 20 year period was 2000 to 2020. And it was really driven mostly by demography. The forward in, uh, economies of the world, the rich countries, Europe, US, Asia, 
they had a massive amount of people in their 50s and 60s that had all of this money, no kids in the house anymore, the house was paid off, and they invested like crazy. And it brought down the cost of capital. It made venture capital this thing that exploded. Stock markets were huge. Getting loans was really cheap, and that happened everywhere. And then in 2020, that generation of people in the, the industrialized company, countries started to retire. And when you retire, you pull your money out of the market. And when you do that, you put it in stuff that's safe, like government bonds, and then the money dries up. And if you look at the data from RepView on revenue per rep quota attainment, it falls off a cliff starting in Q1 2022 after all the COVID shakeout happened. And you match that to crunch base data on when investment started to dry out Q1 2022. And then in the US, if you look at the stock markets, the NASDAQ, the Dow Jones Industrial, um, New York Stock Exchange, all of the returns start to drop when Q1 2022. All of this is sliding out because all the people who have the money that fuel the market are retiring now. Mm. And the generations that are coming back to fill them up are far smaller. And my generation, Gen X, the next one up that's going to actually have money to invest, well, in the US anyway, there are 10 million fewer of us than the previous generation. There just aren't enough of us to fill the chasm. Mm. So what we're already seeing is inflation, higher cost of capital, interest rates coming up, lower investment. And I know you're in Europe, so you probably look with uh, a bit of a smile at our political dialogue right now. Uh, everyone in the US wants to make this political. It's not. Trump didn't do this. Biden's not doing it. These guys can't control this big glacial move, not nearly as much. This is happening. And whoever gets in, in the office next year, it's still going to happen. Mm -hmm. And if it works out okay, they'll take credit. And if it doesn't, they'll try to point fingers and it won't matter because it's going to happen no matter what. But mm -hmm. we're living in this until the next big generation comes up that can replace all that capital. And those are US millennials, but they don't hit their 50s for another 10 years. So mm -hmm. we're stuck in this environment of less capital, less money floating around, higher cost of capital, less investment, which means we just need to be more efficient. Yeah. This is a good thing for business, actually. This is actually going to make us smarter about how we operate, but it's going to be a painful transition. And it probably means that not because of AI, but because of just pure efficiency, about 20% of people who are working in sales today are going to be washed out and they're not going to have jobs on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. Not because they they don't have demand for sales jobs at organizations. It's just because that they're not efficient enough. They never should have been in sales to begin with because they never performed well enough. So yeah. there are going to be other jobs out there for them. We're going to be fine. We're going to have plenty of jobs out there in the market. Sales won't be for everybody. Yeah. And Europe might be even worse off. Was that one of your thoughts? Yeah. So Europe is in even a tougher situation. First, demographically, you don't have millennials. So um, you took all of your money instead of having kids and, you know, buying diapers and strollers, you went on vacation and you bought Maseratis. Good for you. Um, but Germany, the biggest economy, doesn't have millennials. Um, UK is not much better. France is OK, but France kind of takes care of France. So they've never really been, you know, let's yeah. open our arms and be all part of European brotherly love. Italians, my family is Italian. We might be the last ones. I mean, they're gone. They're they're running running out of Italians. So there just aren't enough people demographically. And then you have to look at what's going on in the world. Um, when you look at the economy in Europe, a lot of it was stabilized because of Russian gas. Mm. It was fed by Russian gas, and that's gone now. Mm. And especially when we look at countries like Germany, they made a really hard decision a couple of years ago: be Western or have an industrial society that's fueled with Russian gas. And they made the really tough decision to say, we'll turn off the Russian gas, which wasn't just heating gas that fueled their entire industrial space, their factories. 
and they had to scramble to figure out what was going to be next to stay Western and support Ukraine and stay as part of this, this conversation we have in democracies. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Germany now, you could look at their energy prices and it's staggering. And a lot of their industry is, is offshoring and they're building, rebuilding it in places like Louisiana in the U S just because it's more affordable now to, to move in German industry out of Germany. Wow. Yeah. Exciting times. And, and, uh, yeah, we'll see what's happening, but thanks for the forecast here. I think it's good to be, you know, get a heads up. So we know <laughs> don't overspend in the coming 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's going to be tough globally, yeah. uh, in Europe, Again, unless you could see Europe, Western Europe, throwing back in with the Russians anytime soon, which I would not bet on that happening anytime soon. Energy prices are going to be higher, which means everything is higher. Inflation is higher. Cost of capital is higher. It's going to be a, a tough, tough road ahead. We'll get through it. Uh, yeah. We'll band together, but um, it's it's hard to see these breakdowns happening. Yeah. Oh, well, great. If we circle back to the... Sales yeah. leader, we got um, off topic a little bit right <laughs> yeah no I, I love it and, and it's important because it affects our businesses and our sales cycles and everything so so it it all ties together but uh if we're going down for landing a little bit here you know there's a lot of sales leaders uh reps uh, of all kind of stuff uh titles and so forth or roles what a you know, parting advice would you give to sales leaders and sales reps looking to, you know, future proof themselves and maybe integrate AI into their their processes and their coaching, of course, if they're sales leaders and, and things like that. But what advice mm -hmm. should we bring with us and try to apply to our daily lives? Yeah, so I talk a lot about this in the book um where if you try to boil the ocean and solve every problem all at once you'll solve nothing mm -hmm. so the best thing to do is use a six sigma style root cause analysis on your own business and really look at your numbers look at your performance circle the one area that you can have the most impact on fastest and then drill into what can you do today with what's available today, which you probably don't know what's available because it just came out yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and look at that to see, okay, how can we do better just in this one area, tighten that up and move to something else. And as sales leaders, we know this process because that's how we use coaching with our salespeople. We just have to turn it internally now and look at our own performance and say, hey, I can't fix everything on my team all at once. What's the one area that I should focus on now? Go all in, tighten it up, and then find the next thing to work on. Mm -hmm. That's what's best. And then just be hyper curious about what's available. Talk to people, get into smart communities that revenue leaders are sharing best practices back and forth. The best thing we could do as a species is share information on what is most cutting edge and working and then fit in what works and ignore what doesn't mm. well thank you so much that's awesome and uh, for our listeners who want to read your book or know more about you and your content or triple session you know where can they find you the book you can get on amazon uh, Bezos will support getting his bite and uh, the team over at build.org will get the rest and they will put it to good use helping high school seniors in poor neighborhoods learn entrepreneurship. For me personally, you can find me, I'm best on LinkedIn. So Matt Doyen, my business is Triple Session. Uh, connect with me. I am not inbox zero, but I am in mail zero. So I will <laughs> reply. Uh, TripleSession.com is where you can find our free library of sales training. So you can get in, start learning, applying, use data to improve your sales skills. And you don't have to pay anything for it. It's completely free. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Matt. It was a pleasure to have this conversation. I wish all the best with Triple Session and your book selling uh, you know, endeavors in the future. This was great. Great to be here. Thanks a lot.